أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفكه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا ناجيتم الرسول فقدموا بين يدي نجواكم صدقة ذلك خير لكم وأطهر فإن لم تجدوا فإن الله غفور رحيم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My congratulations to you on this, which was the final Friday of the month of the holy month of Ramadan. And inshallah, inshallah, you've had the opportunity to take advantage of this day and perform some amal that are, uh, inshallah, will be accepted by Allah and your hajat will be answered in this day. Um, if it's been a bit of a hectic day and you haven't had the ability, there's still time, grab it as as you listen to the lecture. And uh, just do it this of salawat. It's one of the mustahab actions for the day of Friday. And what you do is when you complete it, you say, I give the hadiyah, I give the gift of this tasbih of salawat to our, the master of our time, Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, Hajjallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. And may Allah, inshallah, increase in uh, his status and your reward. Ilahi ameen. Uh, we've reached the 28th section of the Holy Quran. We're very close to the end. It seems that tonight we'll get to cover the 28th. Tomorrow, I'll see if we can create a hybrid of the 29th and 30th juz to complete our conversation uh, before the end of the month, which it seems like will be Sunday, so that we can complete our, our, our discussion. But the main theme of this discussion overall has been exposure and interest in reading the Qur'an and building a relationship with the Qur'an. There's a lot of powerful and important things that Allah wants to communicate to you and he's chosen to do this in a medium that we can understand, that we can research, that we can learn from and that we can discuss amongst ourselves and benefit from. There was a time where these discussions were limited to clergy and scholars of the science of the Quran. But Alhamdulillah in our lifetimes the resources have been developed, the um, availability of information, the intellectual capacity of people from going from farmers to well-educated individuals around the world has improved and increased. And this isn't, for example, just the right of the scholars that they should possess the knowledge of the Quran, but rather it's all of our right and all of our responsibility and we can uh, all take advantage of this. One of the suggestions that I have before you know we further with this is getting a good translation of the Quran for those who speak English, especially our youth, um, and that does make a difference to our ability to understand. What I've been using is a translation from uh, Ali Kulli Qara'i, this translation down here by the, this is the translator. And while it's not perfect, uh, this is someone who has a strong understanding of the English language and presents pretty well in terms of making uh, a, a, a logical structural presentation of the English to follow the Arabic but remember something the English translation is a interpretation of the meaning of the Quran the Arabic words that Allah uses at times have multiple meanings and a translator is interpreting and making a selection of what those words mean to create one narrative of what Allah is trying to explain whereas Allah on the other hand in his magnanimous knowledge and, and bounty has given us these Arabic words that contain multiple meanings simultaneously at times and he conveys multiple meanings all at once which is why it said that uh, that every every letter every particle in this Quran can have up to 70 different meanings in terms of how Allah intends to convey a message but it's important that we take advantage of these resources and we take this time and we build a relationship with the Qur'an and 
make sure that we're connected with the message of Allah. And inshallah, inshallah, this month has, our goal was to promote this attachment to the message of Allah and hopefully inshallah it's opened our hearts to reading more and spending more time with the Quran, taking advantage of the resources that we have, uh, you know, including the internet. There's this comment that says, uh, how would I explain to someone who doesn't know what, you know, the internet is that in my hand I possess all of the knowledge in the world and yet all I do is look at funny cat pictures with it. That we need to do more with the access to knowledge and information than we have rather than just simply amusing ourselves. So inshallah, hopefully we've, we've made some progress in this direction and we spent some time studying and learning from the Qur'an and benefiting from the Qur'an and pondering over the words of Allah rather than just looking at funny cat pictures. Uh, in our discussion today, in the 28th part of the Holy Qur'an, the first surah that it begins with is Surah Al-Mujadila. In Surah Al-Mujadila, verses 12 and 13 are the ones that I wanted to discuss today. In verse number 12, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu, idha najaytum ar-rasoolu fuqaddimu bayna yadayn najwaakum sadaqa. All those of you who have faith, when you talk secretly to the Apostle, uh, to the Prophet of Allah, offer a charity before your secret talk. ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَأَطْهُرْ فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ uh, But if you can't afford to make an offering, then Allah is indeed all forgiving, all merciful. The point of this verse was a condition that was happening after the establishment of Islam as a major system of government and a major religion. The people, the aristocrats of Medina, wanted to gain favor and status in society by attaching themselves to the Holy Prophet. So what these aristocrats of society would do is they would schedule and they would insist on having private time with the Holy Prophet and insist on monopolizing that time so that they could show the rest of society how important they were and how important and significant they were to the religion of Islam that Rasulullah would sit in private with them for, for long periods of time and discuss with them. Now the reality was they had nothing to say to the Prophet, they had nothing to gain from the Prophet, they just wanted to kind of look cool and to show people how important and special they are. So because they were monopolizing the time of the Prophet and insisting that they get these private meetings instead of other people who really needed them, or that they would take these private meetings to show among society their great status in Islam and the religion and government of Islam, that Allah set a condition on them. That He set this rule in verse number 12. He says, Oh, those of you who have faith, if you want to have these private meetings with the Holy Prophet, then you have to first give sadaqah and charity and after paying that charity, then you can schedule the time to see the pri Prophet privately. But if you can't afford it and you don't have money to give charity from so that you can meet the Prophet, don't worry, Allah will forgive you. This created a big problem for the aristocrats. Uh, aristocrats, I mean like the wealthy, you know, the elite of society who wanted to show that now that even Islam had come, they were still the elite and the best in society. Because, well... They wanted to look like they were important and special, but they didn't want to spend their money. So, I mean, they could have technically followed the, the commandment, فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ That if you can't afford it, you, you Allah will forgive you and Allah is merciful. But if they, so they got stuck in this like catch-22. They wanted to look special in front of people, but they didn't want to spend their money. They wanted to look rich, famous, and important in front of people, but they didn't want to give up their cash to do it because they didn't really believe in the message of Islam. They just looked at it as a convenient way to move up in society and maintain their position. But now if they tried to have a meeting with the Prophet without paying the tax, that would mean that they're poor and they couldn't stand being known as poor people either. So what happened was because of this, this, this rule that Allah presented, that if you want to talk to the Prophet in private, you got to pay sadaqah, you got to give charity first and then sit with him. And it's mandatory that you do this before you do that, unless if you're really poor. That all the aristocrats, all of the people who had been fighting to get a meeting time for a private meeting with the Holy Prophet, suddenly disappeared. They stopped coming to the Prophet. It said that the only one who followed this injunction was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad who says there is a rule, there is a law that Allah established in the Qur'an that I was the only one to follow. And that was this law that was established in verse number 12 of Surah Al-Mujadila, the 58th Surah of the Holy Qur'an. That in this clause, Imam Ali says, I was the only one who took a dirham or a dinar and split it into 10 dirhams. And every time I would go to see the Prophet, I would pay the charity so that I could sit with him privately and speak to him. 
No one else was willing to pay this charity to have a meeting with the Holy Prophet. Which is why in verse number 13, we see that Allah says, وَأَشْفَقْتُمْ أَن تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْنَ نَجْوَاكُمْ صَدَقَاتٍ فَإِذْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَتَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّقَاةَ وَآتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَالرَّسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah says, Were you apprehensive of offering charities before your secret talks? Now Allah is the one who's beginning the conversation. He says, Ha! Huh. So we uncovered the reality. You didn't want to spend your money to have a private meeting with the Holy Prophet, did you? So as you did not do it, Allah says, فَإِذْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا That you didn't do it. And وَتَابَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ That Allah is clement to you and Allah is forgiving towards you and makes it easy for you to turn back to Allah. Then He says, uh, Maintain the prayer and pay the zakat and obey Allah and His Apostle and Allah is well aware of what you do. So in 13, Allah actually repeals this law, which is why we haven't heard more about it or it's not more commonly discussed in history. Because it was exposing the liars and the people who were trying to take advantage of the religion of Islam. So it was for a short period of time to expose to all of society that nothing was hidden. That all of these people who think they're important and special, once it came time that they had to pay to be able to meet the Prophet, meeting the Prophet didn't seem so as important anymore, did it? Their wealth was more important to them. And that's all Allah wanted was for society to be exposed to the truth of the nature of people and how they behaved. And therefore, after a period of time when it became clear the behavior of the people, Allah repealed this law and allowed people to go and see the Prophet in any condition that they wanted to in the sense of without having to pay. So this shows us an important clause that happens within uh, the history of Islam and how Another way in which we see the difference between Imam Ali and his relationship with the Holy Prophet of how his sincerity and his truthfulness and love of the Holy Prophet continued on in that regardless of whether he had to pay to meet the Holy Prophet or not, Imam Ali was one who was attached to the Prophet. Others who had tried to show themselves to be similar in their attachment, as soon as a financial obligation came upon them, they backed away and they left the Holy Prophet alone. The next surah, Surah Al-Hashr, is the 59th surah of the Qur'an. And in it, we take a look at verses 16 and 17. In verse 16, Allah says, كَمَثَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذْ قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ أُكْفُرُ فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ قَالَ إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنْكَ إِنِّي أَخَافَ اللَّهُ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ this verse talks about a conversation that shaitan has. Allah is saying, or think of shaitan. When he, when he directs man and he commands man to denounce his faith and disbelieve. قَالَ لِلْإِنسَانِ أُكْفُرْ He says to insan, he says to mankind, disbelieve. فَلَمَّا كَفَرَ And man says, okay, and listens, and disbelieves. As soon as man agrees to disbelieve, shaitan comes back and he says, ha, ha. I'm certainly absolved of what you do. I have nothing to do. I'm free of your decision that you made. You made this decision on your own. Certainly, I fear Allah, Rabbul Alameen. I fear Allah, the Lord of the worlds. The point of this verse, again, as we've mentioned before in the Quran as well, too, in different conversations, shaitan's interest, shaitan doesn't hate Allah. Shaitan, the devil, loves Allah. He acknowledges his power. He acknowledges his status. If shaitan hates someone, he hates you and me. And for that reason, shaitan is constantly working at misguiding us from the true path. And the beauty of it is, is as soon as he misguides us, he says, oh, you did it on your own. I didn't do this. This is you disbelieving in Allah. I fear Allah. I wouldn't disbelieve Allah. Shaitan's goal, he himself is not fighting against Allah. He's fighting against you. His goal is simply to destroy your faith. His goal is simply to take you away from Allah. All of these whisperings of doing evil actions and staying away from the path of Allah and doubting Allah's commands and doubting Allah's rules is the whisperings of shaitan that he tries to establish in our soul so that we become separated from the mercy of Allah and we become his companion. And then when we try to blame him that it's his fault we did it, he turns around and he says, no, no, you did this on your own. I fear Allah. I know Allah. I love Allah. I wouldn't do what you did. And this is why Allah continues in verse 17. He says, فَكَانَ 
آقبت ہما ان ہما فن نار خالد نفیح و ذال کا جزا الظالمین سو دا فیت آف بوتھ آف دم Allah is saying, وَآقِبَتَهُمَا The fate of both of them is that they will both be in the fire of hell and they will remain in it forever. And this is the, the reward or the, the compensation of the wrongdoers. Shaitan is going to suffer for what he's done. He knows that. When he disobeyed Allah, he's going to suffer for it. But his goal is not to continue to fight against Allah because he knows the power of Allah is such that there's no fighting against him. He's not trying to fight Allah right now. He's just trying to destroy us. And which is why this month of Ramadan is very important that when you leave this month, you remember who your enemy is and you remember what his goal is. Anything and everything that takes you away from Allah or makes you disbelieve in monotheism and the faith of Allah is the trap of this enemy of yours who wants to destroy you with him. He's like, I'm going to hell anyway. Let me take all of you with me. And that's his goal. His goal is to make man look bad in the eyes of Allah because it was man who caused the downfall of shaitan in the eyes of Allah. Shaitan was, had a great status in the eyes of Allah until man came and Shaitan refused to acknowledge man and then Allah cursed him and cast him out. So Shaitan's goal here, again, same thing. He wants to misguide you, not take responsibility. His enemy is not Allah, his enemy is you and me. And his goal is to destroy our lives. So be careful of the attacks of Shaitan. Be conscientious of what his plan is and make sure that you don't fall into the trap of disbelieving in Allah and following Shaitan. The next verse or the next surah that we take a look at in here is Surah Al-Mumtahana, which we will unfortunately pass over to get to the next surah simply because of the brevity of time. In Surah Al-Saf, uh, which discusses uh, the ranks and the status in the eyes of Allah and then a variety of different things, verses 2 and 3 I think are important to mention. That Allah is speaking to people who have faith very directly and very clearly. He says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, lima tuquluna ma la taf'aloon. Kabura maqtan indallahi an taqulu ma la taf'aloon. These two verses are very important in terms of our relationship with Allah and how we behave with the command of Allah. Allah says to the people who have faith in verse number two, Why do you say that which you don't do? Why, why do you say something and then not do it? And then he continues, It is certainly outrageous and it is greatly outrageous. Maqtan is, is kind of like really bad, really extremely negatively bad. Qabura maqtan indallahi, that it is extremely bad with Allah. An taqulu ma la taf'alun, that you say something and then you don't do it. This verse has a specific incident in the Battle of Uhud when the uh, companions of the Holy Prophet who came to battle were stationed on top of a mountain and told not to move. And they said, we won't move. We'll, we'll do exactly what you say. And I'm moving my head like this because while they said they wouldn't move, they did. They ran away from the mountain. And this running away from the mountain caused grievous losses against the Muslimin and cost Muslim lives. And the reason that they moved is, is that they saw people collecting wealth uh, as the attacking army retreated, so they ran to join the wealth. And as soon as the attacking army saw that the archers that were strategically positioned to protect the flanks and the rear of the army had run away to collect wealth, the army circled back, the enemy army circled back and attacked the Muslimin. Now, had these archers not moved from their position, they would have protected the flank and the back of the army, and the deserting uh, enemies of Islam would have run away and been done with it. Instead, they were able to circle back. So the specific incident was that these people promised, yeah, yeah, Holy Prophet, we won't move. And then they moved. So Allah says, why did you say something and then not do it? And Allah hates that you said something and you made a promise and a commitment, and then you didn't fulfill it. While this is the specific example, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq explains that the context of this is much greater than that. That this habit of being false in your speech, this habit of, of what's literally hypocrisy, saying something and doing the opposite of it, is something that Allah hates, that it's something despised by Allah, and that people should be conscientious of their speech and make sure that when they make a commitment to something, they fulfill that commitment. That honesty is a characteristic of speech and that not being honest about your speech in your speech is something that should be considered impossible for a Muslim to do. 
that we should try our very best that when we make a commitment, we keep it. When we say something, we stand by it. We do the best that we can to fulfill our oaths and accomplish the things that we've promised and not to make commitments or say things that we have no intention of keeping, that we have no ability of keeping, simply to keep face or to keep social status. Rather, the more important status is in the eyes of Allah and Allah is more interested in your sincerity and your truth. So these two verses are, are a reminder to us where Allah is saying, Ya yuhaladina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'alun. Why do you say that what you don't do? Kabura maqtan and Allah. Certainly this is a very bad thing in the eyes of Allah. An taqulu ma la taf'alun. Allah repeats that twice. So it's very important for us to pay attention to. Next we take a look at the 62nd surah of the Holy Quran, which is Surah Al-Jum'ah. Surah Al-Jum'ah, and today being the day of Friday, Alhamdulillah, it seems to be very fortuitous that we, we come across these two together. And that in it, Allah has given us the injunction of joining the Friday prayer. When we take a look at verse number 9 of Surah Al-Jum'ah, Allah says, Ya yuhal ladheena amanu idha nudiya lis salati min yawm al-jum'ati fas'au ila dhikrillahi wadhru al-bay'a. ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Allah gives us a command that, O oh, those of you who have faith, when the call is made for prayer on Friday, hurry towards the remembrance of Allah and leave all your business. This is better for you should you know. Friday holds a special designation amongst the, all of the days um, of the week. It said that uh, there, there's an example given that, for example, the king of the days of the week or the best of the days of the week is Friday, the same way that the best of the months of Allah is the month of Ramadan. So really today is kind of like, you know, a double jackpot. You have the month of Ramadan, Alhamdulillah, which is a month of blessings and is raised above all of the other months that Allah opens his gates of mercy and closes the gates and the influence of shaitan in this month. And at the same point in time, Allah is saying that Friday is the king of days and on this day, O Mu'mineen, O those of you who have faith, leave your affairs and come to the call of Allah and come to prayers. While it's true that in this time period that we live in, in the ghaybat or the absence of the imam over us, that it is mustahab to recite Friday prayers, it is very mustahab and it comes from the Quranic injunction this action that we perform on Friday, this Friday prayer, comes from the Quranic injunction where Allah is telling us, when the call is made for prayer on Friday, hurry towards the remembrance of Allah and leave all your business. It's true, we have jobs, we have responsibilities, but look at what Allah is telling us. He says, وَذَرُ الْبَيْعَ Leave your affairs, leave your sales, leave your businesses and come to Allah. ذَلِكَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ This, that it'll certainly be better for you should you know, is an important explanation that if we want to have a good life, we need to listen to the one who created us and gave us instruction on how to live our lives. And Allah is the one who is telling us that on Fridays, leave your affairs and come to this prayer. And that's really important that if we want to consider ourselves amongst the faithful, that we do our best. Now it may happen that it's not possible, but we do our best to incorporate this prayer into our into our day-to-day -day lives and into our days on Friday and that we make it a part of our habit and not just ours, we inculcate our children into this practice from a young age. During summers, during breaks, we make it a point that we take them with us to Friday prayer so that they learn the importance of this prayer and this action, this community and how Allah has asked us to behave so that they grow up in a language of piety and understanding. We have to make this a part of our habit because Allah has told us in the Quran, make it a part of your habit. And inshallah, when we make it a part of our habit, inshallah, Allah will give us the benefit and the reward for this action. The next surah, Surah Al-Munafiqun, is the surah that's Munafiqun called the hypocrites, those who have a sickness in their heart. Within Surah Munafiqun, very quickly, if we were to take a look at one verse, Allah makes a statement, He says in verse number 10 of Surah Munafiqun, the 63rd surah of the Holy Quran, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّ لَوْ لَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَصَدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ In this verse, the 10th verse of Surah Munafiqun, Allah makes a statement, He says, Spend from that which we have provided you before death comes to any of you, whereat you will say, My Lord, why didn't you give me a little bit more time so that I could spend from my wealth, I could give charity and become one of the righteous? This verse speaks to a few points. 
One, it speaks to the importance of charity. That at your moment of death, at the moment of your dying, you're not going to say, I could pray more. You're not going to say, I could fast more. Those are important things. You're going to ask for just enough time that you could give more charity, that you could give more away from what you possess. Because at that moment of death, you come to the realization that all these things that you're leaving behind, they have no value. It's better that you would have given them away with your own hands than now they're useless, they're wasted. They'll go away to others without any concern or consideration for your opinion. It speaks to the importance that we'll give to charity at that moment, the value that charity will have upon our akhirah, and the fact that at that moment you'll be desperate and this is an easy way to attain greater status in the eyes of Allah. This is one aspect. The other aspect is to talk about, when we talk about the system of charity and the importance of charity, that there's a limited time in which you can do it. And once it's gone, you lose that ability to take advantage of it. Same way in this life. This life is a time in which charity can be taken advantage of. The same way there are periods of time in our life that are more significant than others. And we want to take advantage of them before they pass. Not to beat you over the head with it, but the month of Ramadan is ending. Don't let this month go without you taking advantage of the special, unique, raised status that it has. With any acts of worship that you can do, these, are, these, these final days are the times to rush and to take advantage. We don't know if we'll get this chance again. Our goal is, is never waste an opportunity. And here Allah is describing that this life is an opportunity and giving charity is one of the great things that you can do in this life that will be highly beneficial to you. So don't be one of those people who complains, I wish I would have. I wish I could have. I should have. Do it now. Make changes now. Give charity now. Take advantage of the time you have now. All of these things will be beneficial to you in your akhirah and all of these are things that you will regret if you don't take advantage of. And Allah finishes this surah by He's saying, وَلَنْ يُؤَخِّرَ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah says in the final verse of this surah, He says, and Allah will never respite a soul or give it more time when its time has come. So at that moment of death, nothing's going to change that moment. Nothing is going to extend that amount of time that you have. At that moment, life is over. So take advantage of this time now so that you don't have these regrets when life ends. Next is Surah Al-Taghabun. In Surah Al-Taghabun, there are two verses that are important to talk about. And then after Surah Taghabun is Surah Talaq. And then finally, Surah Tahrim. Taking a look at the limitation of time that we have, Let's take a look at verse number 6 of Surah Tahrim and inshallah that'll be the end of our discussion today. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu qu anfusikum wa ahlikum naram wa quduha an-nasu wal hijaratu alayha mala'ikatun ghilaadun shidadun la ya'suna Allah ma amarahum wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun. Surah number 66, which is the final surah, Surah Tahrim, uh, final surah in section 28. In verse number six, Allah says again to the people have, who have faith. Now the admonishments that we've talked about are specifically for those who have faith, meaning you love Allah, you want to worship Allah. These are important points that if you want to worship Allah and you love Allah that you need to pay attention to. Allah says, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is people and stones, over which are assigned angels, severe and mighty, who do not disobey whatever Allah has commanded them and carry out what they are commanded. The point of this verse, and it's a very important warning, is that save yourselves and your families, not just yourselves, but your families from the fire of hell, whose fuel will be people and stones. The severity of the fire is indicated here and over whom angels are assigned severe and mighty, that these angels will be frightening themselves. Angels are not something that come in one size fits all. They have a frightening, some have a frightening appearance, some have a beautiful appearance. Allah is indicating that the ones that I will put in the, as the in charge of hell are not pretty angels. Well, that they're very severe and mighty. And they don't disobey whatever Allah has commanded them. This should be a hint that at that moment, you'll be pleading with these angels 
that oh angels give me a break stop this don't punish me don't don't give me a painful re result help me spare me but the angels will never listen to anything that you say no matter how convincing it is because Allah has already explained these are angels that will never disobey me and they will carry out whatever they are commanded that though the the punishments that they may be told to carry out on you are severe and strict and someone with uh, compassion in their hearts may not do it. Allah is explaining, don't ask them for compassion. It's not there. They only do what Allah commands them to. Once you're there, you'll suffer for it. And they continue, for example, Ya yuhalladina kafaru, they, the angels will call out all those of you who disbelieved, O faithless ones. La ta'tadhiru al-yawma innama tujizona bima kuntum ta'malun. Do not make any excuses today. No excuses will be accepted from you. You are only being compensated for what you used to do. We need to work together as our families and especially in this time period where we've gone through this extreme situation of this virus is where we've been locked into our houses with our families is to make sure that our family is collectively moving together on one path to move our families together to ensure that each one of us stays attached to this path and stays away from the punishment of Allah and that we acknowledge that our responsibility is to get through this life by loving Allah and doing what he's asked us to and staying away from what he's forbidden. There's something I had a teacher years ago who gave a suggestion. He says, when you turn on the shower and you, everybody likes a hot shower. He says, you make the water hot for yourself to take a hot shower. He says, stand under that hot shower. Make it a little bit hotter. You'll feel a little bit of discomfort. Make it a little bit hotter. It'll be very uncomfortable. He says, make it a little bit hotter than that. And you'll find you can't stand under the water anymore. And his point was, at that moment, acknowledge that this is water that is heated by the fire of this earth. And I can't withstand how hot it is. So imagine now what the fire of hell would be like where there isn't water that's heated by it. And that fire is 70 times hotter than any fire that can exist on this earth or in this reality. And that you yourself are casting yourself into this fire when you disobey Allah. Be careful and conscientious of the responsibilities you have to Allah and protect yourself from the fire of hell and protect your families. Work together. Support each other. Create a positive loving environment that promotes and loves Allah, appreciates those who love Allah, and makes each other want to move forward in their love of Allah. Sometimes what happens is we get embarrassed in front of our families to worship Allah or to be pious because we're afraid we'll be made fun of or that that's not the culture in my house. Make sure you make a good culture to protect the future generations that we have and ourselves. That we worship Allah and we grow the love of Allah in our families. We ask Allah again by the right of this day, by the right of the Hadirin and most importantly the Ghaib Imam. Oh Allah, accept the small ibadat from us. Oh Allah, forgive our sins and cover our flaws. Ya Allah, accept our fasting in this month and don't let this month pass except that you've forgiven all of our sins. O oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of Sahib al-Zaman. Make us and our families and our generations from the supporters of Sahib al-Zaman and entitle us to Shifa of Imam Hussein in dunya and in akhirah. One Surah Fatiha, three times Surah Ikhlas for all of our marhumin and those who are in need of dua with your loudest of salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.